Hi, I'm Shannon Simons, and I'm the author of Booked for Murder, uh, book one in a Bale Fire cozy mystery series. And this is uh, what I'm doing to edit my book. I'm reading it out loud, so I thought I might as well share it with you while I read it out loud. Uh, so you're going to probably hear me drop pages. I'm going to make mistakes. I'm going to stop and correct things. So be patient with me. I'll try to cut it out if it gets too, too awful. So um, this is chapter 10. Booked for Murder, Chapter 10, I Think I'm Falling for You. Ivy gave up on sleep before sunrise, as she did every morning. She checked the phone. Darlene had given her for any messages. Nothing. She wasn't even sure why she was still so neurotic about checking. She looked at the phone on her nightstand. I should toss it into the sea. She showered, dressed, and then sat on her deck, wrapped in a blanket, sipping green tea and watching the sunrise. She didn't want to see Xander this morning. Yesterday was so awkward after Connor dropped her off. Xander had been quiet. He wasn't as involved in the project. She only worked another hour before the tension was too much for her to take. The thought of Connor's easy smile and kindness made her stomach flutter, while Xander put it in a knot. Why do I care what Xander thinks? He's my boss. Good morning. Ivy jumped, startled, heart pounding, before she turned to see Jenny from the bookstore climbing the stairs to her deck. Jenny, you nearly stopped my heart, Ivy said. Jenny pulled the other Adirondack around to face the morning sun and sat down next to Ivy. I just wanted to say hi before I headed over the gathering place's kitchen. Ivy studied Jenny's light brown hair. Ivy thought she looked effortlessly beautiful. Her long hair was braided in thin braids captured in a thick bun. She wore a pair of overalls with a white t-shirt. You're early. You're when to talk. You were up as just as early as I am. Jenny smiled and sipped coffee from her thermos. Truthfully, I'm a little nervous. Aggie promised to come and help with dinner after she closes the shop, but breakfast and lunch were all on me. No pressure, Ivy said and chuckled. Are you nervous? Jenny looked at Ivy with clear, pale green eyes drawn together. Beyond. It's important to me that I do a good job. I, I think my capacity to work with the public at the sanctuary is part of my job. Well, from what little bit of time I've known you, in my opinion, is that you'll be great. Everyone loved you from day one, Jenny said. I'm pretty sure not everyone loves me, Ivy shrugged. I probably shouldn't tell you this. I don't want you to get a big head and go all diva on me. But I'm glad you came to Balefire, Jenny said. Thank you. That means a lot, but I have no idea what I did to deserve it. First of all, you're closer to my age. Second, you're real, no filter, live, and in color. I feel like I can trust you to be honest, and frankly, you're the first person to meet Xander's employment standards, and might match his genius. Besides, I couldn't take another day of him complaining about how hard it was to find help. Ivy looked away, afraid Jessica would see the feelings she was trying desperately to keep under control. He's brilliant. The only thing I feel like I'm an expert at is driving him crazy while I try to keep up with him. Ivy sipped her tea. Jenny was silent for a moment. She glanced at Ivy. You know Connor's like a brother to me. My mom and Aggie raised us together. Aggie told me. Are you worried about Connor? Connor and Xander are only friends from the morning coffee club, Jenny said. Ivy looked out to see. She knew what Jenny was getting at. She could feel her looking straight at her. She clutched her mug with both hands and said quietly, No, I thought that they were always good friends. They're new friends. It took Connor a while to trust Sander and warm up to him. Taking another so slow sip of green tea, Ivy waited for Jenny to go on. I saw you parked with Connor by the side of the road. You looked very cozy. Does Xander know? Ivy's head snapped up. What does my conversation with Connor have to do with Xander? I may work for Xander, but he doesn't own me. No one does. And if you think small town gossip is going to change the way I choose to live my life, think again. Whoa, Jenny held both hands up defensively. I don't care who you date or what you're, what the town thinks. I just care about Connor. And I wanted to give you a heads up. People are already talking. They're wondering if you'll pick Xander for his money or Connor for his good looks and charm. You should have heard the gossip when Xander first came to town and Veronica followed him around like a puppy. My life isn't a spectator sport. I can't live it based on pleasing others, Ivy said. Then she smiled, but I do care about what Aggie thinks. 
She was quiet for a moment and then shrugged. Truth? I care way too much about what others think. I really need a therapist. Jenny stared at her. Ivy was silent and Jenny began blinking rapidly, frozen. Ivy closed her eyes and took a deep breath. I'm sorry. I totally overreacted. I'm sure you're trying to help. It's just that I don't want to be the center of attention or be judged, you know? Jenny's shoulders dropped and she gave Ivy a micro smile. Nobody wants to be judged. I get it. And it's inevitable when you live in a small town. If you're not careful, you can make a reputation for yourself that the locals will hang on to forever. When Mel and I got divorced, everyone knew all my business. I wouldn't wish that on anyone, especially Connor. I don't know how it is in Balefire, but I can tell you how it is at a Harvard library. My ex was constantly seen on campus spending time with his friend Kat. Everyone asked about her. My fellow librarians wanted to know why he was with her. Did I know? What was going on? And more. It didn't help that she was so strikingly beautiful. She kept her hair cut short, you know, and shaved on the sides. She's muscular. She wears a lot of wife beaters to show off her full sleeve tattoos. She's a unique beauty, you know? Her eyes are huge like a cat. Even though she intimidated me and I worried about the relationship, I defended him to all of my coworkers. And then I realized that Kat would do anything for him, and the truth became obvious. He would do anything for her. Jenny turned and looked at Ivy. I am so sorry. I know what it's like to be intimidated by the other woman. It seems like everyone that's been cheated on says the same thing. It doesn't seem to matter who the other person is or what they look like. We end up comparing ourselves to them and killing ourselves trying to lose weight or look better. No matter how hard we try, most of us still feel inadequate right? He was always free climbing or mountain climbing with her and their other friends. After watching him climb beside her, I was so jealous and I felt so inadequate that I tried climbing. You tried free climbing? Mountains? Hey, despite my short height and size, I am exceptionally strong, you know, like an ant. Librarians haul some weighty books, Ivy chuckled. I'm also afraid of heights. I was terrified. But I climbed with them. I wasted my time doing something I hate to compete with her. He was so engrossed in their chat and climb, he wouldn't have noticed if I'd fallen to my death. I'd find them talking so intimately it led to our first real fight. That sounds awful. It was like competing with a female Amazon while walking a tightrope, you know, like Wonder Woman? Jenny shook her head. What finally happened? Did he stop seeing her? Cat is one of the reasons I left him. No matter how many weights I lifted or marathons I ran, she was faster and better. Finally, I realized that I was never going to be able to compete or come between their friendship, if that's what it was. I was something he owned, and yet I was an outsider in my own marriage. I get that. I hated always wondering what Mel was thinking. The unknown. My opinion may not matter to you, but from the short time I've known you, and from what you just told me, your ex is a massive jerk. I hope one of his free climbs ends up in a free fall. Ivy smiled at Jen. You don't really, do you? Jen giggled. Let me think about that. They laughed together, an easy laugh like new friends. I can't say I wish them well. I kind of felt like I had to stay in perfect shape to be worthy of him. Now that we're separated, I still feel like I have to stay in shape, but for a different reason. I'm always afraid he'll show up and there'll be a fight. I think any woman using online apps and facing the world alone should know how to fight. Is he really that violent? Jenny asked. Yeah, yeah, he is. I can already tell your ex Mel doesn't deserve you. It's his loss, especially when you have children together. It's like you've given a pig a pearl and he's gone back to the trough for swill. Or like having a world-class chef as a wife and trading her out for a Barbie who can't cook. Jenny's laughter was contagious. Finally, Ivy stood up and stretched. We better get to work. Our list of things to do before the event is as long as my arms. and I have to make sure every cabin is ready and the packets for the attendees are in the appropriate cabins. And I have to make some breakfast, which will be served promptly at nine. Jenny stood up, slightly taller than Ivy's small frame, and smiled at her. I'm on your side. I promise I have your back. Ivy and Jenny walked together to the gathering place. Jenny... Did you know about Bonnie? Ivy asked. Jenny spun back around on her heel. Why are you asking? Do you think I had something to do with what happened? 
Ivy put her hands in the air like she was erasing a whiteboard. No, not at all. I just, I can't stop wondering why no one cares about her death. Weren't you at the reunion too? Jenny nodded and they fell back into the easy pattern of walking side by side. I was there and uh, I care. I was horrified. It was my ex-husband Mel's reunion. He might have known Bonnie, but I met her for the first time that night. I was cooking like I'm doing this weekend. Ask Debbie. She was in the kitchen all night cooking with me. She was there when Jack came in drunk. Veronica was already at the gathering place when Jenny and Ivy arrived. Hi, Ivy said and walked over to the dry erase board. Can everyone gather around for a minute? Are you in charge? I've been working with Sandra on this for quite some time, Veronica said. Ivy winced and looked at Veronica. Xander had ideas, all the ideas you two put together and wanted me to take the lead this weekend to see if I'm capable of working on events in the future. I made a list of tasks we need to do before everyone arrives and what we thought we'd set up and work might go faster if we pair up. I have one list with the kitchen tasks for Jenny and a second list with other tasks, including doing a last minute check on the cabins. Which project do you want to work on, Veronica? Well, I guess I'll work with Debbie. We'll do the cabins. We don't want a repeat of the other morning, Veronica said. She looked at Debbie and pointed at the door. They left and the room was quiet. I'm sorry, Jenny. I I don't know why I can't stop talking about Bonnie. I can't shake this need to know what happened. Whether it comes from living in the same cabin she was in or my unusual obsession, my need to solve puzzles and find answers. If you ask me, Bonnie's death is making solving this murder a pretty dangerous puzzle, Jenny said. If it was murder. I know you'll think I'm stupid, but my friend and I did a little detective work before we graduated from high school. He smiled. Was it solving the case of the missing cat who stole Sally's lunch? Or something like that, Ivy said. More like Scooby-Doo and I was Velma. If it wasn't for those darn kids, Jenny said, laughing with Ivy at her own joke. Seriously, no, stop laughing. This is serious business. Jenny snorted and covered her mouth. Every time I walk in my cabin, I'm reminded of Bonnie. Now, I don't mean to upset you by talking about it, especially because it sounds like Mel and Bonnie had something going on or a friendship. I'll try not to in the future, Ivy said. Well, I'm not upset or offended. It had nothing to do with me. I've totally let go of Mel. He's an ex as ex gets. But I doubt her death had anything to do with any of our friends. And I am an ironclad alibi. (laughs) Jenny said, Debbie and Connor were with me in the kitchen. Connor came and went, but Debbie was there when he wasn't. Debbie and I were too busy to take a break. There was a drunk bothering me who saw me too. I was cooking and running a bar in this very room. That sounds awful. I'm so sorry. Who was the drunk? Ivy asked. Jenny gave her a sideways glance and put a finger on her lips. It probably doesn't matter. We better get started, Ivy said. Jenny laid her recipes out on the counter while Veronica and Deb passed the kitchen going to the next cabin. Ivy watched them until they were out of sight. Well, I need to look out for the drunk tonight. Do you mind telling me who it was? Somebody that's coming, maybe? Jack, Debbie's husband. He's fine until he drinks, and then all bets are off. Jenny said while she unpacked a box of food on the counter and began putting everything away. I'm glad Connor was with you. What did Debbie say? Ivy asked. She didn't say a word. She looked red-faced and angry. I played the whole thing down like it was no big deal. I told Connor and he kept an eye on Jack after walking him to his cabin. The only person I was worried about was John, Jack's son. The Davises and Veronica's family have two really great kids. I wish their parents paid more attention to them, Jenny said. Seems like they're always getting caught up in their own drama. Well, then it's a good thing this weekend is focused on their kids. Ivy smiled at Jenny. You know, Jenny, I could really use a friend. I love living in a sanctuary, but life is sort of crickets after hours. Ivy raised one brow and bit her lip, waiting to see what Jenny would say. Jenny stood up from the box she was unloading, wiped her hands off on her apron and smiled. I'd love a friend, too. You know, we're the only single women in town who aren't into drinking and partying with the fishermen. Connor's a fisherman, Ivy laughed. Not like these fishermen. They stink like rum, rotten fish, pickles, and ocean air. I think every single one of them has a massive new truck or a rusty old one, Jenny shivered. Hey now, don't be a truck snob, Ivy said. I'd be happy with a truck or a mom van. 
I thought Xander gave you the Range Rover, Jenny asked, while hefting frozen food into a deep freeze in the storage closet behind the kitchen. It's just a loner. Hey, will you hold the freezer door open, Jenny asked. Ivy held the walk-in refrigerator door open while Jenny stocked it. Hey, uh, we're only going to be here for three days. How much chicken and beef can we eat? It's cheaper if I buy it in bulk from a local farmer who sells organic beef. We can leave what we don't use and let Anderson know. He'll use it. Aggie should be here soon with her yummy baked goods, Ivy said. My favorite is her spiced chai and cinnamon rolls, Jenny laughed. Ivy thought it would be nice to have a human friend to talk to, as long as she could stop telling everyone about her past. Hi, I just thought I'd tell you a little bit about what inspired this chapter and where you are in the story. And please excuse my rough reading. I was making notes and stopping and going. Um, so by this time, you know who the murderer is, probably, or you've met the murderer. Uh, you know kind of what the plot might be. And if you don't, it's okay. Hang on. You're going to find out. Um, and I do promise a happy ending. I love happy endings. I always like a little romance and a mystery, too. I think it's super fun that way. So what you may have missed in the chapters that I've gone back and edited after posting them is that um, Ivy and I have something in common. She likes to eat her emotions, and sometimes I do the same thing, even when I don't want to, even when the doctor tells me not to. Um, I, I'm not a great, like, cook. I don't make, like asparagus and great vegetables, but I am pretty good at cake. I've got cookies down to a science. I am great at chocolate chip cookies and I'm getting really good at pumpkin bars. So, um, I'm cutting some recipes back into the book. Um, and we've already passed them. So when the book comes out, I'm hoping I can get them all into the manuscript at the end of the manuscript for sure. And if not a QR code so that you can go to them and download them and and cook. So one of them would be my great grandmother's chocolate cake, which is priceless. It was at every birthday party at the beach. Um, I think also, uh, I'll probably put in a really great cranberry salad. And I know that sounds funny, but the holidays are coming and trust me. Uh, I'll see if I can get it in my newsletter. This is a cranberry salad made with fresh cranberries that are not cooked. And so, it's really unusual and unique. And when I take it to Christmas parties and Thanksgiving parties, it, the whole thing gets eaten by everybody. Everybody loves it. So I think food is a great way to get to know each other. And I think cooking and doing events like Jenny and Ivy are, you actually get really connected with people that you hang out with and cook and serve together. I'm going to fly this weekend to a conference in Salt Lake City. Well, it's in Provo in Utah. And, um, my daughter's going to meet me there. We like writing together. We wrote together uh, articles for KSL or Desert Digital Media. And we're going to volunteer at the conference, which will be kind of fun. And we actually, I signed up because I thought it's a good way to get to know people. Sometimes out here on the coast, we're in our little cozy mystery corner and you don't get to chat with people except for online. So I'm really looking forward to seeing some faces that I know and, and friends while I'm there and meeting new friends. So wish me luck. I will try to get the chapter up before I leave. If not, you'll get two the next week. And pray that it doesn't snow between here and the airport. We are two hours away from the airport. And uh, it always makes me nervous. Like, I don't drive into the city very often in the winter, but I'm going to risk it and we're going to have fun. So I'll talk to you next week.